one of them welcome to another session of the YM webinar series. And um, today we actually going to do something different. The industry is changing. Everybody is moving towards technology now. Now there are instances where um, we have driverless dump trucks. We have driverless uh, machines operating underground because someone sits somewhere and operates them. What is the need for all of us? What do we have to do as professionals? Because we also need to adjust to the industry and the, and the current trend. We have to do that is um, Solomon Achampo. He's a computer programmer and also a geomatic engineer. So he's going to take us through what AI means and what is it that AI can do for the mining industry. Good afternoon. I guess everyone can hear me. My name is um, Solomon Achampo and um, I'm a graduate from um, K University, and um, I am currently working with um, King Kubi Solutions. Um, we are into borehole and drilling, and uh, with um, operations in um, gold fields, Asanko and uh, other mines. And aside my engineering aspects, um, I also work on my own projects as a software engineer. And um, we will get to that. Let's start. Okay, um, so um, the whole presentation is about how we can use um, AI, artificial. I normally don't want to call it AI because um, AI is um, very broad. Um, so normally, I normally call it um, artificial neural networks. Um, so, and here we will be um, using it um, in mineral exploration. So as I said, my name is Sulema Champong, and um, I have my startup, my own startup company called Architect, and you can log on to the website and check out my website. You, know, so you can follow me on GitHub if you are a developer, a software developer, you can follow me on GitHub, um, then we can talk more. Okay, let's start. So the outline, the outline is going to be about, we're going to see some brief introduction about mineral exploration. And also after that, we will see some of the challenges facing um, the mineral exploration industry. And also we check out the aims and objectives. And um, we'll see about the introduction to AI. And now um, the implementation, I'll take, you, I'll take you guys a little bit further into how the AI actually works. So by the time of this section, you guys will have some knowledge in um, artificial neural networks and how it's been applied in so many fields. And then I will take you in depth into um, mineral exploration. And then from there, we will have our conclusion and then Q and A. So let's start. So some brief introduction to mineral exploration. You see, exploration is one of the longest and most inherently risky phases in the life cycle of a mine. And, um, Coming. Okay, the life cycle of The goal of an early stage exploration program today is to collect, we analyze the data, and then we interpret the data to help focus on new deposits with um, discovery. So the whole idea about exploration is to um, um, discover new deposits of uh, minerals. So the data collected during early exploration helps the geology teams determine drill hole targets. And also um, data collected through these drill programs is a key component in the mineral resources. And um, projects reaching the criteria milestone that helps to um, de-risk it, um, such as mineral resource estimates, preliminary economic assessment, and feasibility studies. So let's see some challenges. The reason why, um, uh, AI comes in and solve all of these challenges. So here we have too much data. Um, data has in, if you go back to, let's say, um, 40 or 50 years, data 
um, of, um, of geological data. So there is, as you read, so today geological team gain information on project via soil and chip samples. Um, electromagnetic service, geophysical service, geochem, remote sensing data, indicator method, real results, and even historical data. With over billions of data collected over the past 25 to 30 years, and um, due to the complexity of data, even most experienced geologists will find it very hard to analyze and interpret the data when given the database. But AI is able to find connections for communal exploration and find better targets. So let's say you have um, a whole huge um, sum of, let's say, geophysical data, magnetic data, let's say, geochemistry data. You have satellite imagery. You have um, your historical data. All these um, data sets will be very difficult for even an experienced geologist to sit down and interpret everything. That's why there is a need for a certain, we need to train a certain system to do that job for us. Um, okay. So, and second one, we see cost. Normally, um, mining and exploration industry normally spend huge sums of money in exploration alone, because if you don't explore the minerals, how are you going to mine the minerals? That's, um, that's basically the early stage of mining. You have to first explore where the mine is before you can mine um, the mineral. So they spend, they spend huge sums of money on that sector alone. And you see lack of latest um, technical knowledge. And also we have lack of experience insights and evolving in experience geologists at this prospecting area. Failure to discover new deposits normally cause the industry a loss. That also talks about um, the cost involved and also lack of time. Normally, um, people want to rush into um, um, the mining area, so they don't normally have time on that exploration. And, but that is the basic thing that you have to do before you can go into proper mine. You have to get um, good exploration um, um, and before you can, uh, I mean, get into proper mining. So let's. So the aim of this uh, project is to apply the power of AI to analyze large amount of data produced by mineral exploration and analyze it to produce explorative targets and uncover hidden geological insights. Later on through the presentation, you'll see um, I've developed some algorithms that is aiding in um, um, to predict some good um, deposits. So later on through the presentation, you'll see. And one of the objectives here is to reduce cost in exploring minerals, also to reduce time spent in analyzing large data, and also um, to help assist geologists to well interpret predicted mineral deposits also minimize human error, and also to explore less, increase rate of discovery, and less guesswork. So now, introduction to AI. So what is AI? The whole concept about AI. So um, you can see AI dates back 70 years ago, 1950, where one of our legends uh, in, in our computer world, he is, he is one of our, uh, he is our Einstein. That's uh, how I should put it. In our computer world, he is our Einstein. And his name is um, Alan Turing. Um, he wrote a paper on um, computing machinery and um, intelligence, asking the question how we can make machines think. Generally, his idea was um, um, a certain robot uh, mimicking all the characters of human actually we haven't reached there, uh, reached there yet. I think um, with the life of um, with the likes of quantum computing, I think uh, we can get we can hit that target. But as of um, this time, we've not yet reached what Alan Turing was actually talking about, as in um, a certain robot with um, uh, with uh, human capabilities can think on its own 
can cook, can do everything on its own, just like uh, we humans we do, but we've not reached there yet. So um, within the slide, you see, I will break down the AI into some sections and then you see what I'm talking about. So AI is the ability of machines to learn from experience without explicit programming in order to perform cognitive functions associated with the human mind. So here you can see AI is um, different from traditional programming. AI is rather the opposite of traditional programming. When you are um, coding a software, you actually, um, you actually um, uh, code the software with the data that you have. But with the AI, you don't code the, uh, the system with, with the, you rather feed the system with the data. It's rather the opposite of traditional programming. That's um, normally traditional programming is you are coding to produce a data. AI you already have the data. So you feed the system with the data and AI will rather give you um, the, the, let's say the, the, um, the results that you're looking for. Yeah, the results that you're looking for. So, um, it's, so this is the subset that I was talking about. Right now, I think um, machine learning was during the 1990s year. That was where machine learning was um, was brought about. At that time, um, data was coming up. I think at that time there were powerful uh, programming languages like the likes of Java and C++ was high enough to get a lot of data. So machine learning was around that area. And then during the 2000s where um, supercomputers and then quantum computers came around, there was the need for a deep learning. That's how we can train a system to think deeply. And later on, you know how the deep learning works. And here you can see um, the general concept is artificial intelligence. And then the AI, the machine learning is a subset. And the deep learning is a subset of the machine learning. So here you have examples of machine. There are a whole lot of examples of machine learning, uh, of AI. We have machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing. Natural language processing is uh, more like um, text to speech or speech to text. Um, so you can actually code a system or train a system to convert from French to English. Um, and also you can actually train a system to convert what you type into a speech. Um, I have a lot of uh, projects on natural language projects, but I didn't actually include this on this presentation. That would have been so many. So I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, we have expert system. Expert system is more like uh, what we use it in Forex trading. So here you can actually train a system or train an intelligence to trade. So you, the human, you will be sitting there trading it, but um, the intelligence system will be trading and fetching your money for you. We have robotics, you all know about robotics. We have machine and or computer vision. Computer vision, during the presentation, you see examples of computer vision, so I won't um, talk much about it. And we have speech recognition. Normally, speech recognition, uh, that's what, I don't know whether um, Ghana, our Air Forces and the Police Department are using this, but when you go to US, the NSA and the CIA, they use these algorithms a lot especially the speech. Uh, once someone records your speech, they, they can use the speech recognition to actually track that person down. Um, let's see, so the life cycle of AI. So what goes into the AI? So any AI projects follow this um, life cycle. So here you have to define a, a challenge and then you see the approach, the approach where the team breaks down the defined problem and um, into workable steps to translate the right data to achieve results. And then we have um, the expertise here, expertise, you have to sit down, think we, uh, since we are not fully um, geologist or let's say, considering me for instance, I'm not fully geologist, I'm a geomatic engineer. So when I'm doing this one, uh, when I was doing this one, I actually um, seeked um, a lot of help from other um, um, senior geologists. One is in, 
One is, I think, he's the assistant uh, exploration manager at uh, Anglo Good Asante in Takwa. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lin Kofiosep. Yeah. So you have to sit down with a lot of um, experts, then you seek the advice on how you can design a system to suit their expectation. So that's where the experts, expertise comes, uh, comes in. So the fourth is philosophy here. You embrace fail fast continuous improvement practices to evaluate their success in translating data to achieve results. The source data team understands and obtain the right data that explains the problem to achieve results. The six is where um, normally depends on you, either the software engineer or the programmer or the data scientist or the, or let's say the engineer. So here the production, you have to find the suitable algorithms that will um, suit what you and your team discussed in the first five. So here you train and test AI models. And also um, you test the AI models, um, you test the accuracy, and then once you know it's perfect, until you then deploy. Yeah, so at this stage is is very um, critical. If you fail at the number six, you have to, I think you have to go back to the number five. You have to go back to number five and then you evaluate the data. Sometimes it depends on the data. So if you fail at number six, you have to go back to number four and then do the number four again and come back to number five and then you have to do your number six again. So our tools. So um, this project, uh, normally what we use um, uh, is what I listed as our tools. So here I stated data science. So that's the whole concept. What we will be doing is um, data science. Uh, data science is very broad. So we'll be using the data science concept to do this. Um, the term big data is our geological data set. So it's big because it's not just um, real whole data or it's not just geophysical data, but rather combination of a lot of um, data. Um, so you have geophysical, uh, you have geo geochemical data, you have um, satellite imagery. A whole lot of data is coming, is coming, um, to combine themselves um, for the system to process. So it's very big. So that's why we, we normally call it um, big data. And then we'll be using machine learning algorithms. Uh, as I've described above the, you already know how the machine learning works. Um, and then at some point we'll be using deep learning. We'll be, we'll be using a lot of deep learning here because of, um, there is a satellite imagery. So you have to um, process, you have, you have to use computer vision. Yeah, I think I listed it here, remote sensing and computer vision technique to analyze the satellite imagery. So here the computer vision uses deep learning concept. And then also you have to use, I think we have to also use deep learning on, on one of the big data something like historical historical data yeah geological historical data there you cannot use machine learning algorithms there because it won't best fit it so here you want to use the deep learning to apply it on um any other geological historical data here and then our visualization we'll be using um gis to visualize um our mineral deposits yeah so i normally use QGIS a lot, a lot because it is open source quantum just um, so that's what we'll be doing. So let's take a little bit, a uh, little look about machine learning and deep, uh, deep learning. So that is the difference, difference between machine learning and deep learning. Um, I guess you can see it. So let's say you have a Twitter data. So when you're applying machine learning on Twitter data, you call something feature engineering. Feature engineering, actually, every algorithm has its way of extracting signatures from a set of data. So here, the machine learning performs its um, feature engineering 
it has its classification and its output. But in the concept of deep learning, you we will get to deep learning, you will know what I'm talking about. You know what this um, circle circle with line lines, um, the top there you see ANN, meaning artificial neural network. So it's the combination of um, feature engineering, the combination of feature engineering and classification to output your results for you. Uh, let's see. So let's take a little bit, a uh, little look about um, machine learning. So what is machine learning? We have three main types, the supervised. The supervisors, um, you actually um, help the AI or, or whatever um, network that you are training. It's like you are helping a child to work. So you, you hold the hand of that child and help the child to work. That's what we termed as a supervised learning. We have unsupervised. So unsupervised is like a semi-supervised. So you actually tell him, normally unsupervised deals with classes. So let's say you want to, you want to uh, perform a certain classification on, let's say, a mineral samples. Now, with this mineral samples, um, you don't want to um, train the network um, by showing the network everything that, that you have. So you just give the network, let's say, the rock samples. You say, hey, there's the rock samples. And I'm giving you um, five classes. So let's see, I'm giving you five classes. Classify these, class, uh, these rock samples among the five classes that I've given you. So normally that's unsupervised. So it will be, it will be dependent on the network or the algorithm to, to extract each feature. As I talk about top here, performs um, feature engineering. It will be dependent on the network to perform that feature engineering to, to say, okay, let's say this is, um, this rock A has a red, a red color Rock C has a red color. So let me classify Rock A and Rock C to class one and do stuff. Yeah, that's how the unsupervised work. The reinforced learning is brutal. Here we don't actually tell the network anything. We will just give the network a profit and a loss. It's like a reward and a beatings. So let's say a child is working. So um, you won't show you won't show the, the child how to work. You just allow the child to work. Now, when the child um, falls down, you beat the, the child. But anytime the child takes, let's say, one or two steps, you give the child a candy. Yeah, that's where the reinforced learning. Um, that's how the reinforced learning works. You give we give normally we call the network an agent. So. Anytime an agent makes um, a good call or a good resource, we give the agent a resource. Let's say, normally it's a mark. So let's say, move from A to B. Or no, move from A to C. If the network is able to move from, straight from A to B, A to C, we will give um, a reward of, let's say, plus four, a plus four. But if the network is able to move from, a to B, there is a reward of plus one. Have you seen the difference? So there is um, a plus three difference there. So we, we actually, um, we have um, taken my, like three from the reward that we're supposed to give to the agent. So that's how the array enforced learning works. So here we have a set of algorithms. We have the linear regression. Linear regression normally works with a regression um, data, as in continuous data, logistics normally classification data, uh, naive bias, naive base, yeah, uh -huh. and um, this is entry. This entry is normally um, yes or no, as in are you a boy? Yes. If you are a boy, what is your age? This. If you are this age, what can you do? That's that's how the decision tree works. So let's get to deep learning. 
um, deep learning is um, a little bit, it will be a little bit confusion, but it is very easy. So if you take your time, you understand uh, the deep learning. So it's a subfield in machine learning. And um, it's a structure, this structure was inspired by the human brain. So they actually looked at the human brain and then they, they decided to mimic that nature. Um, it follows the perceptron rule. So yeah, you can see, I, I showed you a picture, quite deep learning. And then when it was tested, uh, its performance were, was very powerful. I think um, Deep Plane, one of our forefathers, he, he's still alive. I've forgotten his name. He's at the University of Toronto in Canada. Yeah. Uh, he's one of our forefathers. He spent um, uh, most of his time um, developing Deep learning algorithms in the late 90s. Yeah. So, um, so there's it. Deep learning is very, powerful in performance and um, it can do a lot of stuff. Later on, you will know how the deep learning works through the presentation. So let's see um, the artificial neuron. So an artificial neuron is a mathematical function based on a model of biological neurons where each neuron takes inputs, weighs them separately, sums them and passes this sum through a nonlinear function to produce an output. I think uh, the formula is W times um, H plus the bias. Yeah, that's the basic formula for um, deep learning. So here you can see uh, the neuron in the human brain. You can see the input signals and, the, and the, um, then writes, and uh, you see the, the myelin shaft, and then you see where the axon outputs the signal, the axon terminals. So it follows the same here. So here, the deep learning, you place in your inputs. It goes, the circle area, we normally call it the heading area. That's, let's say, the cell nucleus. That is inside the, the cell nucleus. That's where the magic that is a whole, it's not any magic, it's a whole lot of mathematical calculations. A whole lot of mathematical calculations that uh, over the course of the years, um, they researched and then produced all those algorithms. And then it will output your results for you. So let's see perceptron. Perceptron is a neural network unit um, that does certain computations. So let's say here, the, all those mathematical models, uh, we call it perception because that is where all the computations um, occur. Um, we have a single layer perception and a multi layer perception. So here you see I've shown you an example of multiple layer perception where um, there is a single input and then there is four hidden layers and then there is an output. Here we have a single layer and a, and a multiple layer. And then you see the perceptron rule. Anytime the, the network makes an error, it goes back and adds the width. It goes back and adds the width. So it will, it will be going, it's like a loop. It will be going back until the error minimizes, until it prints the output. Since um, it's not fully AI course, um, I won't take you much more deep into the activation function and the net input function. Well, we are not doing AI, fully AI uh, course here. I just want to show you how we can use AI um, in mineral exploration. So let's continue. So here you have um, a deep learning examples. So basically this is how the whole thing works an untrained neural network model. And then we feed that model with a, a data set or we train that data set. So here our data set will be what I talked about, uh, about um, the geological data sets as in the geophysical and the geochemistry and uh, the other data sets. We train those data sets to the network. And then the record, uh, we call something inference. 
inference. So what is inference? Inference is um, after we've trained the model, is um, after we, we've um, trained the model, we will, um, I think I should, I should use the word, um, infer, infer the results. Infer the results in such a way that um, we will deploy the model so that we can um, input any other untrained data. Whenever we input any other untrained data to the model, it should give us a predicted resource. When you get down there, you, you will understand what I'm talking about. We, we, we develop an algorithm to train our data sets. When we train our data sets, we have to test our data set with a certain new um, and with a certain new data set, not the data set that we used to train the network, but with a new data set. So when we train uh, our new data set and then we test our accuracy and it's okay, we will infer the results in such a way that anytime we feed the model with a new data, so here as you can see, there's a new data, a new data, there's a new data here. Anytime we feed a network with a new data, it should give us a very good predicted resource. So here we give the network a picture of a cat. And then the, the network was able to predict that, oh, this is actually a cat. But um, this picture wasn't part of uh, the pictures that we used to train the network here. This picture is rather different. So, but yes, the, the network was able to um, give us a very good result of, oh, there's a, a, a cat. And that's how we tell that our model is very intelligent, our model is very good. So we can deploy or use it. So this example, um, the figure one, I did it for one of my seniors. Um, I think he, he completed today, uh, he completed, he will complete this year, a PhD candidate there. He's one of my seniors. So I did, I did it to predict um, GPS readings on IGS stations. So here, I actually, I had to design um, an interface for him so that uh, all that he'll be doing will, will be clicking so that he won't see the codes. <laughs> he, was, uh, he wasn't familiar with the codes. So I actually had to design a GUI for him. This not just, um, so when you click the file, you import the data that you want to train. So this is the training, the training stage. So when you click on the, um, the file, you import your CSV data, the, the, the data that you want to train. So here I gave him the options to select the parameters that he wants the network, the, the network to train on. And it, when you should select um, what he wants the network to predict. We call something um, iterations or epoch. Iterations, as you know, iterations is looping. So that's the number of times you have to loop the network. Um, the more it's like exercising, the more you exercise, the more you gain muscles. So that's how um, the network is. Again, we are not doing fully AI, so I won't take you too much into it. So let's see uh, also example of um, the computer vision. Here's where the inference is working. So this is another project that I did. I was just testing a, um, a computer vision on the, um, um, it's called object detection. So here I train a model on a lot of objects, like a bag, um, laptop phones, and all those stuff. So, and then you see here, this one, I'm running it on an Android phone. So before that model can run on an Android phone, you see, you have to infer it before it can run on, an, uh, on a device. So here, I train a network on my laptop, and then I infer the model and then develop an app using that model. So here you see it can um, predict, I use it on my laptop um, space bar and you see you can predict that it's a computer keyboard of 90% or, or it's either a space bar. 
So you can see the percentage or say, oh no, this cannot be a space bar. I think if even if it can be a space bar, it's just 7.45%, but this is definitely a computer keyboard. So let's see some example videos. So um, this video is uh, a network mimicking uh, human walking, have you seen? This one is mimicking uh, human. This one, you cannot use normal machine learning to do it. You have to use the deep learning to do it. And then you, the example here, you can see the deep learner has learned to play um, um, Google game when maybe you are browsing and your internet um, gets uh, disconnected. So the, the network has learned how to play that game. And this one, I did it, uh, I think, uh, lately. I think around July or so. I was testing on the COVID-19 model. So as you can see, I was testing on COVID-19. So here, you can see I don't have a mask. The network is showing me I, do, I don't have a mask. Uh, so it's using my camera to detect. Now the moment I wear the mask, and it is saying, oh, okay, thanks for wearing a mask. So here, you can actually uh, use it, use this um, example. You can actually use it uh, in, let's say, banks. Uh, that if I come in and you're not wearing a mask, the door won't open. But if you're wearing a mask, the door will open. So basically, these are some of examples of how, where the deep learning applies. So let's get into the mineral exploration aspects. Sorry. So the model's design. So how are we going to train the network to do these stuff? So here we teach a system by showing it known gold mines plus up to 100 or more layers of geological data about each mine. It should be 100 or more because it's supposed to be very plenty. Otherwise, the network won't perform as you want it. The system then finds unique signatures for each mine. It can find up to 60 million, which is a few more than a geologist could find. I guess you all will forgive me. Um, so um, let's continue about the model design. So this is actually the model design, how we are going to um, 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 generate our model and then um, uh, output or I get a mineral deposit here. Yeah. So let's see. So I designed a system called Architect Geology System. It's actually, uh, I'm still improving on it. I have a private repository on GitHub. Um, after the section, any developer who wants to join the team will can contact Mr. Mario or, or me, then we can talk about it. So um, this system is, is using AI in a form of machine learning, deep learning, um, computer vision, as you see here. You see, I, I applied all the three here. So it's using machine learning, the deep learning, the computer vision and cognitive analysis for rapidly generating quality exploration target for minerals. That compares the data of thousands of, of known deposits against the data of areas to be explored. So the system looks for obvious correlation in data. So here, uh, it, it, it performs correlations. Um, it, uh, it performs a hidden patterns, clusters, relationship across massive data sets. So it actually need a very massive data set, not just some two or three pictures. Actually, um, when I was training the COVID-19 uh, data set, uh, the COVID-19 model, I think I, I used, um, uh, I think I used about 200 people wearing masks and then 200 people who are not wearing masks. And then I trained the network with that. And then the network was able to know or tell when you are not wearing a mask or you are wearing a mask. So let's see. Um, sorry.
So let's see. So um, the system actually comprises of uh, uh, data preparation algorithm. This is uh, one of the important stages in data preparation. If your data is not good, your model won't work well. As I said it um, earlier at the top there, once you fail at number six, you have to start from number four. So your data preparation is very, um, very important here. You have to prepare your data, you have to clean your data. So this alone is about 60% um, of the whole project. Anytime I'm doing a data science project, my data preparation alone can take me about 60% um, of my time because you have to generate a um, lot of algorithms um, to prepare your data, to clean your data. First of all, you prepare the data, you clean the data of any unwanted, um, let's say any, any unwanted data. Let's say a, um, a list of, uh, let's say data with string data sets. Let's say a list of names, and then you find numbers in names. So let's say you can have about 100,000 names, but you yourself, you, you wouldn't know if there is a number inside. But if you, if you write a very good algorithms that can actually um, pinpoint all these mistakes inside, you can see um, your data will be very, very well equipped and very prepared for training. So here we have the training data set algorithm. That's actually, uh, after you've prepared the data, we have an algorithm for training our system. We have the mineral search algorithm. After we've, um, we, we, we've trained, we have another algorithm that will be testing uh, mineral deposits. And then another algorithm that will actually test our accuracy, how um, our accuracy works. So, so here we start, the starting point for the um, AGS, that is the architect, architect geology system is the data preparation algorithm. Um, this actually takes the raw data layer and prepares them for input to the training data sets. Initially, the data preparation creates a number of new data layer using the data image processing. So you see we have satellite imagery inside. So here, um, when you use your remote sensing um, skills to, let's say, process your satellite imagery and all those stuff, and then you apply it here. So actually, here to be using, um, I think, computer vision here to, 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 to um, Steady, steady some patterns on the imagery. Um, satellite imagery on mining areas um, are different from satellite imagery in, let's say, a forest or other stuff. So when you train a network on some uh, satellite imagery on mining areas, it will, it can actually, it, uh, it will, um, I don't know, I've uh, forgotten the English that I want to use, but it will actually um, take a unique signatures from that imagery and create its own pattern that it will use to predict any new um, uh, mineral deposits. Anytime you, 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 tell that, um, you tell the network, okay, I'm giving you this area, tell me where there, there will be a potential mineral deposit. So it will go back to, um, its history and then it was come through, okay, when I was learning, I learned that on uh, this satellite imagery, uh, this mining area, there was this, there was that, on this satellite imagery too, or at this mining area, there was this and that, and you and it, it will use that one to predict um, on the new area that you've given it. Let's continue. So here you see the DPA increases the number of data layers to usually just over 100 Depending on the amount of initial raw data, the DPA data set is now fed into the training data that is used to train the model. Um, the data set is created by inputting a set of special data on known mineral deposits. The special data set is created by geoscientists and a group of, uh, and grouped and ranked with the highest 
ranking being for large economic renewable deposits and uh, true to the lowest rank of simple mineral occurrence. So here is a DPA data set layers are added to the TSD. The algorithm then uses machine learning and deep learning and cognitive algorithms to create a neural processing chain which allocates each spatial separate area, a mineral geologic model. Validation and testing is done, is then done to test the accuracy of this model. You see, at every, uh, at every um, machine learning model training, you have to test the accuracy. Normally we accept accuracy from 80% uh, going, once it's 80% going, it's, is, is within the range, it's acceptable, and then you can use that model. Um, so you have this one. So the mineral search algorithm. The mineral search algorithm is the largest and most intensive algorithm. So because here we are predicting, so we have to be very careful here. Once you predict a false deposit and maybe um, the mines trust you, and then you predict a false uh deposit and then they go and they mine and then nothing there you see you are in trouble so here is very it's very most intense so here to uh i have to spend more time here and then write a lot uh, good a very good algorithms um that will get you um, a good result so the targets area spatial boundaries and targets for data are input to the data preparation algorithm which prepares the raw data so here we've seen we still have to have to prepare the data. Data preparation is very important because once there is a fault in your data preparation, your model won't work well. It's very important. So this is the whole model. This is the whole concept. Um, so uh, about the six slides of talk that uh, uh, of talks that I talked there about the architect geology model. This actually this is the whole thing of what that's happening. We train um we train geologic data up to some layers and then we have to predict it will the the model will find a unique signatures normally this uh is the picture i took from i think uh uh good spots here yeah. good spots canada it is a picture that they are also involved in these stuffs yeah they are also involved in uh, implement if uh, one of them Sorry about my my networks. That's, sometimes it kills me a lot. So how would you know this works? So we are getting to the end of the slides. So how would you know this works? We test the system by asking it to find other known gold mines that hasn't been trained on. So as I said it earlier, the top there, you have to test the network with um, with a data that has not been trained. So a new set of data sets that has not been trained on. That's the only way we can know that this system works very well. The final, we have to visualize it. Uh, we have to visualize it on, on the, um, um on gis so this one i took from i think uh queenstein i think queenstein university also there is a professor there um uh, that i normally talk uh, talk with him 
uh, he actually uh, showed him uh, showed me his process how he did this and then um, i actually uh, showed him my algorithms and my ideas and then uh, he said oh, okay he's very ahead but this is how he does this and i was very happy so i took this one for him um actually i'm not yet i've not yet uh output the results but my algorithms are still ongoing um, as i said it's um if we're a software developer or a geologist who want to join the team and once you talk to me, let's uh once you talk to mr Murray, and then we will we will know what to do from there next so the output of the system is a prospective map and spatial data showing how the target exploration areas compared to known a mineral deposit form around the world. This allowed you scientists to, to, to decrease risk in exploration and um, enhance the efficiency of exploration programs. So here you can see, we can just sit uh, in the comfort of our offices and then we train a network to do just huge money some project for us. So that's how um, the AI actually uh, works. It's, um, it's, it's meant to do a lot of things um, easy for us uh, with no um, hard works and all those stuff. So in conclusion, I would say AI can take a large amount of data. It doesn't care the data that you give it. Once um, you have a very uh, high computing power, um, I think you can. So here you see the machine that I'm using, um, it uses a very high computing power. So anytime I'm training my model, it goes faster. You cannot use um, just normal machine to train an AI model. You need a very powerful machine to train an AI model. And it doesn't care, once your computing power is very high, it doesn't care the amount of data that you give it. It can process your data for you. And also the right technology can help reduce the risk of inherent exploration and also lead to more manual discoveries on budgets, rewarding those that deploy their data most efficient, effectively. Companies that are able to harness this power will tip the scale in their favor. I think for Canada, Canada, they are very ahead in, in um, AI exploration in mining. They are very ahead. Canada and you know, Australia is, has now started, but Canada is very ahead in, uh, when it's in terms of AI in mineral. I think so. As a result, mineral exploration is no longer so much an art of interpretation, but instead it becomes closer to a pure science, giving geologists a whole field perspective of all the data. So you see here, here it's not coming to take the works of a geologist, but rather it's, um, it's rather um, going to help the geologist uh, in his works. Yeah, thank you.